evening friends today our guest speaker is dr prashant sharma from chandigarh he is going to lecture on non transfusion dependent thalassemia genotypic basis and determinants of severity this webinar is brought to you by mumbai hematology group it is supported by natco oncology and managed by perfect square i thank mr james raja kumar and their team from natco mr yash mr kalpesh and the team from perfect square executive committee of mumbai hematology group the guest speaker dr prashant sharma all our discussants who are themselves eminent hematologists or hematopathologists new participants for sparing your saturday evening if you are from india the morning or afternoon if you are from other parts of the world website of mumbai hematology group can be accessed at www.mhgindia.com there is no password required all our future academic activities are put up there and you can choose what you want to attend tomorrow morning we were supposed to have this webinar on bone marrow transplantation versus car t therapy by dr ritu jain unfortunately she has not been able to make it so this webinar stands cancelled our discussants today are very important personalities and they have been put up alphabetically here to dr akshaya mandloi from suraksha diagnostics kolkata dr amit jain from pediatric hemato oncology center bmt transplant center mumbai dr amit khurana from surat dr vijita datta from esi pgi msr manikthala kolkata dr gopinathan m from scpgi lucknow dr gunjan prashad from apollo hospital kolkata dr hasmuk balar from surat hematology center kiran hospital surat dr jagdish chandra from esi model hospital and pgi msr new delhi dr mopali ghosh from institute of hematology and transfusion medicine kolkata dr nidhi dikshit associate consultant apollo hospital kolkata dr pranta chakravarti director hematology in bmt amri hospital kolkata dr priyanka samal from ims and sum hospital bhubaneswar kana dr rajat kapoor from command hospital eastern command kolkata dr sangeeta mudliya from bj wadia hospital for children parel mumbai dr satish kumar a from manipal hospital bangalore dr shruti kakkar from dayanand medical college and hospital ludhiana dr sunil bhat from majumdar shah cancer center narayan health city bangalore dr urmi mala bhattacharji from pgi mer chandigarh It's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker of the day. Dr. Prashant Sharma is MD, DNP, Dip RC Path, DM. is professor in the Department of Hematology at the prestigious Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education Research, Chandigarh. He did his MBBS from UCMS Delhi University, MD Pathology from Maulana Azad Medical College, Delhi University. and dm in hematopathology from aims new delhi he completed a research stint at the university of zurich his specialization is in disorders of red cells and erythropoiesis other areas of his interest include lab automation and flow cytometry as pi he has various projects related to ngs based testing in thalassemia borderline hemoglobin a2 situations flow cytometric assays for g6pd deficiency and cell cycle analysis and the genetics of inherited erythrocytosis he has received various awards honors and distinctions and held official positions in scientific societies starting right from the medical school till date including the associate editorship of the ijhpt and membership of various committees of the international society of lab hematology 
is a member of the international inherent group of the study of red cells. He has over 170 peer-reviewed research publications and is author of four monographs. He's going to speak to us today on NTDT, genotypic basis and determinants of severity. Thank you and over to our guest speaker. Thank you uh, very much, sir, uh, for that extremely kind invitation. Uh, I hope uh, I'm audible. My slides are uh, visible in a full screen mode. Yes, for sure. Thank you, sir. Um, I'd uh, also like to thank the Mumbai Hematology Group for uh, uh, extending this invitation for me to come and speak over here today. My topic here today is uh, chosen. Uh, I, I had the liberty of choosing the topic, so I chose NTDTs their genotypic basis and determinants of severity. Because this is a topic uh, that I was a part of two guideline writing groups recently. First was uh, in the IAP uh, on thalassemia and the second was the uh, I was an ICMR uh, 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 Indian College of Hematologists tickle cell guidelines, which has been released very recently. Uh, and in both of them, uh, we realized that these are terms that uh, are often a little uh, uh, puzzling or uh, not a slightly nebulous, uh, especially uh, if somebody uh, doesn't really uh, work a lot in the hemoglobin disorders. So uh, so starting first with NTDT, if I do a PubMed search within inverted commas, which means it uh, searches exactly the uh, terms in this order, then the NTDT is a relatively recent occurrence on this uh, uh, in this database. It is first used in 1993 from a very prominent Lebanese group. It occurs in only one citation uh, till 2014 when the uh, use of this term uh, increases uh, quite dramatically and it's still going strong. Uh, on the other hand, the related term, which often uh, leads to uh, some uh, confusion, can lead to confusion, uh, is thalassemia intermedia. This is a term that's been around much longer. The first use was in 1959, when uh, this uh, American uh, case report described a child who, would, uh, who was genotypically uh, double heterozygous. He had hemoglobin lepor and beta thalassemia on two different alleles. He presented with what was obviously a less severe disease than beta thalassemia major. He presented at seven years of age with splenomegaly and only occasional transfusion required. So what we now know to be the classic presentation of thalassemia intermedia. So what exactly is non-transfusion dependent thalassemia? What does the term uh, include? Well, it includes those thalassemic patients, first of all, who are not dependent on transfusions to sustain their life, as is obvious from the, uh, from the words themselves. It's actually a group of disorders, which includes beta thalassemia intermedia, HBE, plus beta thalassemia, double heterozygous state, and HBH disease. So as far as the uh, trans, uh, Thalassemia International Federation is considered, their current uh, documents use NTDT to encompass these three entities when they're talking about them collectively. And the reason for grouping all of these together is uh, probably obvious to uh, uh, the audience. It's because they, while they are genotypically very heterogeneous, phenotypically, they tend to have a relatively similar or at least extensively overlapping spectrum of clinical features. In addition, there was an interesting uh, uh, editorial by uh, Dr. Weatherall, uh, a giant in the field, and he extended uh, this umbrella term of NTDT to also include the very mild uh, African patients who have hemoglobin C and beta thalassemia as a double heterozygous. So uh, hemoglobin C is not common at all in India. And in fact, if in a diagnostic practice, one sees a, an HPLC peak, which is looking like hemoglobin C, it will almost always turn out to be something else and not hemoglobin C. In addition, and this is from the Weatherall paper, they also used NTDT for hemoglobin S beta thalassemia. Now this is interesting. And one, to understand why they did this, one has to realize that most of the beta thalassemia mutations prevalent in the uh, 
uh, in Northern and Central Africa, where hemoglobin S is also common, are beta plus mutations or milder mutations. Uh, and therefore, their patients tend, their patients who have S beta tend to be milder in phenotype than their SS patients. On the other hand, in India, patients who have sickle beta thalassemia, the double heterozygous state, typically have, a, have an S beta genotype. And the reason for this, I'm going to be telling you uh, in a subsequent slide. And once they have this, the phenotype basically is influenced by the fact that they have very high quantities of uh, sickle hemoglobin and very little quantity of the uh, adult hemoglobin. And they tend to behave largely similar sickle cell anemia, of course, with some uh, subtle differences, which probably will get covered in the seminar on SCD. Over time, as the spectrum of disorders that present with globin uh, protein abnormalities, by which we mean high hemoglobin F, et cetera, has expanded uh, to include genes which are not located within the beta globin or alpha globin gene cluster, other entities have also gotten included in the NTDT group. And amongst these are novel combinations, for instance, homozygous KLF1 mutations, or in the heterozygous state, they act as phenotypic modifiers of beta globin uh, mutations. So with that out of the way, uh, let's quickly uh, take a recap of thalassemias because obviously we need to get a handle on this to understand the NTTPs. Uh, it's well known that if you include the uh, heterozygous states, then they are the commonest monogenic disorders worldwide. And that's because the, het the heterozygotes reach polymorphic frequencies across the world. Sitting in Chandigarh, we see 3 to 5% of the population as beta thaltrate and another equal number as hemoglobin D Punjab rate, which is, of course, not a thalassemia. Uh, they are prevalent in this belt across the center uh, of the Earth in the equator. Uh, and they, these disorders are characterized by a defective or reduced biosynthesis or one or more globin chain subunits. So the predominant hemoglobin in adults, which is HbA, is comprised of two alpha globin chains and two beta globin polypeptide chains. And each of these chains has within its heme pocket a heme protopopyrin group, which uh, is responsible for oxygen transport. So what happens in thalassemias is that one or the other of the globin uh, genes has a mutation which gives rise to underproduction. And uh, depending on which globin gene is affected, whether it's the alpha, beta, gamma, or delta, we classify it as one of these thalassemia. So alpha thalassemia, beta, and so on. In addition, there are some genes which are located next to or adjacent to each other in the cluster. And they can get in, deleted together if the deletion is large enough Right, So that's the reason why we also have curious entities called delta beta thalassemia and gamma delta beta thalassemia. So these are autosomal recessive disorders. And uh, like I said, the heterozygous, heterozygous states are really common. Actually, alpha thalassemia heterozygotes are commoner in India than beta uh, thalassemia heterozygotes. For alpha thalassemia, the situation uh, when I say heterozygous, is a little complicated because we have four alpha globin genes. And when I, uh, so we mean people who have alpha thalassemia trait, which means two out of those four are deleted, or they could be silent carriers, by which I mean only one uh, out of the uh, four is uh, deleted. And I'm using the word deletions here because they are the commoner, commoner genetic events in alpha thalassemia. So even though alpha thalassemia uh, traits are commoner than beta thalassemia traits, we predominantly, and there are a lot of clinicians amongst the uh, discussants, we predominantly see the beta thalassemia, uh, which is commoner in our clinical practice. And the reason for that is uh, because in alpha thalassemia, we have alpha plus thalassemia, which means that one of the chromosome 16s at least has some residual alpha chain output and not, <coughs> excuse me, a zero output, which means which happens when both the alpha alleles, alpha genes from that chromosome are lost. So since we have alpha plus thalassemia, the predominant genotype that we have is this, which means that from each of the chromosome 16s, we're going to have a little bit of alpha globin production. And if people like these are going to be marrying other people like themselves, then their children are going to be exactly like them. On the other hand, in Southeast Asia, we have the alpha not genotype, 
which means that if people like this are marrying people like this, then we are going to have HBH disease in 50% of the offspring. And if they marry someone like themselves, then half the children are going to have hemoglobin Barts hydropsky times. And uh, I put it, I put this in here because alpha uh, is a major player in non-transfusion dependent thalassemias. So thalassemias are monogenic disorders. They are they arise due to uh, a mutation that uh, knocks off production from a globin gene. But clinically, these disorders behave as polygenic traits. And we have a whole spectrum. So we have beta thalassemia minor, patients who typically don't require transfusions. At the, on the other end of the spectrum, we have patients with beta thalassemia major. These typically inherit two beta naught or severe beta mutations. And as a consequence, they require regular lifelong transfusions. And subsequently, they develop iron overload. So they require chelation for survival. In the intermediate zone, we have a very wide spectrum which comprises the beta thalassemia intermedia. And these are patients who do not require blood trans, who may require blood transfusions on and off, but who don't require them, for whom transfusions are not necessary for their survival. And the reason why we see this very wide range of uh, uh, phenotypes in thalassemia intermedia, as well as in NTDT, is because there are several genetic modifiers that affect phenotype. And these can be classified into primary, secondary, and tertiary modifiers. And that's useful to bear in mind even when we are ordering or interpreting laboratory tests. So um, when we talk of primary modifiers, we basically mean the thalassemic mutations that are giving rise to the disorder in the first place. And these uh, mutations can range from null mutations, which give rise typically to beta naught kind of a uh, situation and due to a complete absence of globin production, or those in which a little bit of production is retained. And these are beta plus mutations. And I'll tell you why certain mutations go completely zero and why some of them can uh, still uh, yield a minimal amount of globin chain production. So in beta thalassemia, the common uh, events are point mutations. And these typically result from single base substitutions or minor insertion deletions of a few bases. They may affect any level of gene regulation. And uh, for instance, they could affect transcription or post-translational processing or the translation of this mRNA into protein. Although it is a very heterogeneous disorder, even at a genetic level, over 600 beta mutations are known already. In India, if we look at beta mutations, five are predominant. Of these, two are splice site mutations, two lead to frame shifts, and only one is a larger, is a moderate size deletion. So the IVS15, which in study after study from India is the commonest mutation, is a stevia beta plus mutation. In reality, it behaves pretty much like a beta naught mutation. Then we have an IVS11, which is a beta naught mutation. But now just remember that IVS11 is uh, inherited in its beta globin cluster along with the XMN1 plus allele. So what is this XMN1 plus allele? This is a polymorphism in the G gamma, gamma globin gene or a HBG uh, gene. This is the G1 gene. And this results in an increased amount of HBF production. So although IVS11 is a beta naught allele, patients who are homozygous for IVS11 and whom we would expect to behave as beta thalassemia major or transfusion dependent thalassemia, Typically, they have some amelioration because they will also have the XMN status as plus plus. Then we have the remaining three uh, mutations, which are all beta naught. So again, a practical point from the uh, realization that all of these mutations are beta naught uh, is that the thalassemias in India tend to be much more commonly thalassemia major or transfusion dependent as compared to non-transfusion dependent or intermediate great because the commoner mutations are all severe. The other practical implication for this uh, 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 data is that all of these mutations are associated with a high level of hemoglobin A2 in their heterozygous states. And which is why hemoglobin HPLC, which relies on detecting a high and elevated HPA2 to diagnose beta thalassemia trait, is a very successful screening tool in India because the common mutations will all have high A2.
We then have the less common mutations. There is a codon 15 and a codon 16 point mutations. And then we have these two, which are the commonest milder beta mutations, which is a capsite mutation. Now the capsite is a site which is upstream of the actual coding sequence of the gene, as well as a minus 88. So the minus here also means that this is upstream. And which means that the coding sequence is intact. It is actually the regulatory sequences of the gene which are going to be affected. And therefore the damage is left. And these typically present the ones in violet as beta plus mutations. So that was the primary modifiers. We then have a big set of modifiers, which are secondary modifiers, by which we mean that the beta globin allele is separate, but the alpha globin genotype is ameliorating or exacerbating the disease. And the first of these is alpha globin gene number or the genotype. This is easy to understand if you remember that the primary pathology in beta thalassemia is actually an intramedullary apoptosis of erythroid precursors and not peripheral hemolysis. And this ineffective erythropoiesis or intramedullary death results due to intracellular precipitation of the excess alpha globin chains in beta naught, beta naught patients because these alpha globin chains now have no beta globin uh, chains to bind to. Therefore, patients who co-inherit two alpha gene deletions along with beta thalassemia major or homozygous beta thalassemia will actually have less alpha globin, which is precipitating in their um, uh, erythroid precursors and will therefore end up presenting as beta thalassemia intermedia. On the other hand, patients, uh, persons who have beta thalassemia trait, heterozygotes, whom we expect to be asymptomatic, but who are unlucky enough to inherit Extra, extra numbers of alpha globin genes, which could be triplicated or quadruplicated instead of the two, which is the normal number, will tend to have moderate to severe anemia and will end up having thalassemia intermedia. The other secondary modifier is, a variant, is the variation in fetal hemoglobin production. And that's because if we have an increase in he, fetal hemoglobin production, then gamma globin polypeptide chains, which then become available, will be able to balance out the alpha to non-alpha chain ratio. They will give rise to hemoglobin F, alpha 2, gamma 2, and mop up the extra alpha globin, which is becoming available because the beta globin is not there. And this will again ameliorate the severity of anemia in beta thal. So about one third of the genetic variation in the level of hemoglobin F, which is a very substantial proportion, can be explained simply by the typing of the XMN1 G gamma polymorphism. This is, like I said, a, poly, a single nucleotide uh, SNP uh, in the G gamma globin gene. Over the years, especially in the last decade and a half, several other prominent loci have been discovered that also affect the fetal hemoglobin levels, although to a slightly lesser extent. So what is it about fetal hemoglobin? We all know that HBF is the predominant form of hemoglobin, uh, starting at about three months of gestation in age and going on till birth, after which its levels start declining. So why does this happen? It's because various uh, other genes kick into action and lead to uh, epigenetic modification of the gamma globin genes. They, give, they synthesize transcription factors that lead to modification of the chromatin, typically methylation of the promoters of the gamma globin, and that lead to a reduction of the gamma globin gene, out, the two of them, output. At the same time, repressor, repression of the beta globin gene is moved away, and that's a single gene, HBB per chromosome uh, 11, and production begins to go up. So approximately around with somewhere between three to six months of extra uterine life, the adult hemoglobin, which is alpha 2, beta 2, becomes the predominant form and fetal hemoglobin production declines, becoming almost uh, less than 1% or undetectable by one year, by the end of infancy or attainment of one year of age. So what are these extra uh, genes outside the beta globin cluster, which are going to shut down uh, gamma globin and say, you know, your time is up. Uh, uh, go to sleep. These are transcription genes that code for transcription factors like MIB, uh, BCL11A, and KLF1. And these lead to what is known as the beta, uh, gamma to beta switch. And the expression of these transcription factors will in turn determine the expression of other genes like SOC6 and the TR2 and the TR4 uh, nuclear receptors. So now there are 
three main uh, uh, groups which have been uh, discovered and the KLF one is a relatively more recent entrant into the F regulatory space. So starting first with KLF one, this is a transcription factor that binds directly with HBB. So obviously it's going to be uh, helping us uh, decipher our uh, non-transfusion dependent thalassemias. This binds to the regulatory element, uh, which is five prime upstream of the beta globin cluster. And once the, if the KLF1 is inactivated in the homozygous state, this is uh, incompatible with life unless the fetus is, res unless the fetus is rescued by intrauterine transplants. The BCL11A has some predominant polymorphisms, which are now known uh, to uh, be extremely important in regulating the uh, HBF switch. This is, a, again, a very important gene for several hematopoietic lineages. It acts as a repressor of gamma globin synthesis, and it acts by so several downstream uh, modifiers, uh, which are GATA1, trend of GATA1, and SOC6. The MIP is uh, a gene which it by itself codes a transcription factor, which is a key regulator of hematopoiesis. MIP itself has its regulators. These are present in a, in a big genomic region called the HPS1L MIP intergenic region. And several polymorphisms have now been described, both in this region as well as the gene itself, that will lead to the um, uh, modulation of fetal hemoglobin levels. So by now, we have a whole armamentarium of uh, genes which regulate how much the, gamma uh, the two gamma globin genes are going to be downregulated in the period of infancy. And so it's easy to imagine that this is why it behaves like a polygenic trait, because polymorphisms or in fact mutations in these genes can give rise to myriad uh, uh, phenotypic effects. And don't forget this beta locus control region, which is right uh, there on chromosome 11 upstream. And this locus control region is actually a long range uh, regulatory element. We call it cis because it's on the same chromosome, but it's actually located between 6,000 to 22,000 bases upstream, even of this embryonic epsilon globin gene. So how does it act? It, it it, so what happens is the transcription factors from all those uh, pro genes that we talked about will come and bind to the LCR. Sometimes they will also bind to the lo lo loci around the genes or within the genes themselves. But once they bind to the LCR, this LCR is going to enhance the transcriptional activity of the linked genes. And how does this work? Uh, the Currently, the most outstanding model, the most uh, uh, widely accepted model of how the LCR works is called the looping model, which means that once our transcription factors bind to the LCR, the entire uh, chromatin is going to form a loop and go and actually bind to the promoter of the particular gene that is going to be enhanced. So you can imagine what a beautiful interplay this is, that depending on the balance of transcription factors that are binding to it, the uh, LCR is going to go and bind to one or the other of the beta globin genes preference uh, the beta globin gene cluster gene, so gamma or beta or delta, and give rise to uh, an upregulation of that particular uh, gene's output. On the other hand, if there are uh, uh, either physiologically a downregulation or uh, 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 you know, genetic events which are leading to this event getting disrupted, then the upregulation of their gene is not going to happen. So with that bit of pathogenetic uh, Thing, we'll leave it behind because it might uh, uh, get a little heavy sometimes. So those were the secondary modifiers. We then have tertiary modifiers of which we really won't be talking too much today, but these are loci, remember, that modify the progression and complications of the disease. So examples of these include uh, modulators of iron overload. So the HFE gene, um, which uh, stands for a high ferritin, that's actually how the name was derived, uh, has uh, mutations. So you can call them polymorphisms, because especially in uh, uh, the Western countries, they're uh, present at a very high frequency. And these give rise to uh, iron overload, although there is some contradictory data from India as well. Uh, bone health in thalassemia is detect determined by polymorphisms in um, transforming growth factor beta gene, uh, vitamin D receptor, as well as the collagen genes. Uh, variations in genes that uh, uh, promote or reduce redox activity can give rise to uh, uh, increased or reduced iron toxicity and can influence the myocardial function. Specific HLA antigens are associated with susceptibility to infections as well as liver fibrosis. And there are variants in genes that influence thrombosis, which is 
a less common but a well documented complication of thalassemia so these are the three levels of modifiers which are going to influence the uh, phenotype of patients with ntdd and that's because these patients they may get away from a transfusion react uh, requirement because they inherited a beta plus allele and i'll give you a list of those in a minute but they may, will still become uh, they may be uh, susceptible to any of these complications because they were just unlucky enough to inherit the wrong form of this particular gene so uh, uh, with that we we'll head back to the uh, various uh, phenotypes that we see in thalassemia and they can sometimes be difficult at a clinical level to define because ultimately what we can see in this uh, diagram is that it is a continuum i didn't make this particular diagram is not specific boxed uh, discrete entity so how do we distinguish transfusion dependent versus non transfusion dependent thalassemia on a practical basis typically if a patient is presenting at less than 2 years of age he, he or she should be labeled as transfusion dependent if the degree of anemia is severe and most authorities will take uh, cutoffs of 6 to 7 grams per deciliter for this again transfusion dependent if the anemia is affecting their daily life uh, they are going to be transfusion dependent splenomegaly is typically uh, highly variable in ntdd but is severe in uh, thalassemia uh, in uh, transfusion dependent thalassemia uh, they tend to have massive splenomegaly especially if they are under transfused jaundice is more common in ntdt and skeletal deformity is typically more so in tdt growth retardation also in tdt transfusion dependence of course is the basis for the distinction and for the laboratory criteria we'll see them as we go along within the ntdt there is a whole range of manifestations so attempts have been made to further subclassify these patients one of the most commonly used criteria are from this university in thailand mahidol university and uh, they have uh, divided it based on uh, hemoglobin in the steady state age of first transfusion requirement of transfusions spleen size age at thalassemia presentation growth and development uh, as well as uh, and these are the criteria based on which they give them scores and will then divide ti uh, or ntdt into mild moderate and severe uh, groups the original mahidol classification was for the uh, uh, hbe beta thalassemia group which is the prototype ntdt uh, in uh, thailand uh, which is in southeast asia but remember this applies equally well to the other forms of ntdt as well so with that we'll turn our attention to the beta thalassemia intermedias subgroup of ntdt which is the predominant uh, genotypic form and that's also the form which is commonest in most of india with the exception of possibly the eastern part of india so what are the genotypes that give rise to this form of ntdt the, uh, we can classify them depending on whether both the beta globin alleles are affected or the person is heterozygous for a beta mutation so in the first group we typically tend to have patients who are either homozygous or compound heterozygous for a mild or very mild which means a beta plus or a beta plus plus thalassemic anemia so they going to have residual beta globin production and uh, therefore going to be not very transfusion dependent and the uh, tip prototype uh, of this these are cat plus 1 which is common all over india the ivs uh, 16 so it is a little far away from the splice site so the damage is not so much the plus 33 this is uh, in the intronic region the minus 101 so when we say minus it means it's upstream of the uh, uh, transcription uh, site initiation uh, so again it's a regulatory region minus 88 this is common amongst the jat 6 in uh, the punjab area minus 87 it's just right next to it minus 29 and subsequently also mutations in the poly 8 tail or the and this is uh, actually after the exon 3 and these uh, result in post uh, uh, you know post uh, mrna synthesis supports transcription uh, processing of the mrna and its stability the cap site also results in that alternatively uh, patients with ti may be compound heterozygous for one mild and one severe allele so obviously uh, sometimes if the severe beta plus by which we mean the ivs15 most often is combined with a minus 88 or a cap plus 1 again that patient is going to have a milder course occasionally we'll have patients who will be compound heterozygous for 
severe or very severe mutations. So we can have IVS 1.5 homozygotes or 6 or 9 base pair deletion with frame shift uh, 41, 42, who are going to be behaving like thalintamibia. And these patients are puzzles because they should be behaving severely. In those patients, we are typically going to find either an alpha thalassemia trait or occasionally even an HBH disease, if one tests for that. And uh, alternatively, they may have inherited a non-deletional form of HPSH, by of which the commonest is this XMN1 G gamma polymorphism. Altern or they may have promoter mutations in either of the gamma globin genes, which resulted in the gamma globin production not declining post-infancy. They may also be having uh, showing increased synthesis of gamma globin uh, chains, which is not linked to the beta globin cluster. Both of these were uh, uh, the gamma globin itself had, or its promoter had the genetic event. And uh, on the other hand, if somebody has an inactivating KLF1 mutation in the heterozygous state, their gamma globin production is going to be stepped up. So a lot of this sounds like a laboratory uh, speak, but uh, this is important when you're trying to track down the cause. Uh, and if you looked at the gamma globin cluster and you can't find a cause there, you need to move on to the uh, transacting factors. In addition, patients who are uh, in, who have inherited a delta beta thalassemia or are homos uh, along with beta thalassemia, so they are compound heterozygous, or they are homozygous for delta beta thalassemia, typically will have a high F. And the reason for that is interesting. Remember when I told you that, uh, when I showed you in a slide previously about the looping of the LCR to the HBF region? Oops. So, in delta beta thalassemia, what happens is that the delta and the beta uh, genes are both deleted. It's most commonly deletional. So the LCR, once it's uh, the chromatin loop is trying to loop, is going to have no beta and have no delta globin genes to loop to. So all its attention is going to be focused on the gamma globin genes. So however much nature might have tried to silence them, the fact that uh, they're getting so much uh, extra attention from uh, all the promoters, which normally should have been focused on beta and the delta globin genes, F is going to be stepped up. Uh, in a, uh, on the other hand, we'll have some patients with beta thalassemia intermedia who are heterozygous, which means only one beta thalassemia mutation is found when we test for them. And in such patients, one needs to initiate testing for co-inherited, triplicated, or quadruplicated alpha genes. Alpha genes can be uh, can uh, alpha globin, uh, typically has deletions, so they can get knocked out, but they can also become supernumerary, so their numbers can go up for a very curious reason. In addition, uh, there is a condition called dominant beta thalassemia. This typically happens when the mutation in beta globin is in the third exon. So what it means is that there will be synthesis of an mRNA, which is, however, incomplete. And this mRNA will give rise to a partial polypeptide chain which is very unstable. And if you have unstable beta globin chains, although they are not as bad as unstable alpha globin chains, they're still deleterious and they're going to be precipitating and giving rise to an inter thalassemia intermedia kind of a picture. Occasionally, we'll have initiator codon mutations, which even in the uh, heterozygous state are going to be acting dominantly. So why, when we look at the first uh, and the commonest reason for heterozygous beta thalassemia to present as non-transfusion dependent thalassemia, uh, why does the alpha globin have such a propensity for supernumerary genes? Well, the reason is that the alpha two and the alpha one globin genes have a lot of structural homology with each other. These are genes that arose evolutionarily at, as a result of gene duplication events. So they actually differ from each other in just a few nucleotides. They're really, and which also for laboratories is, uh, makes it a little difficult to sequence them because you need to be sure that the mutation you're calling is there in the alpha one or is it there in the alpha two gene. So what happens as a result of this structural homology is that during meiosis, the alpha two should be, uh, when the two homologous chromosomes are going to line up, and then going to have uh, crossovers or exchange of genetic material, instead of the alpha two lining up with the alpha two and the alpha one with the alpha one, the Z boxes of alpha two and alpha one can line up against each other. Okay, that's because they're similar. And whereas these guys don't have anything closer to li line up with. And then what will happen is they'll still exchange material, but 
This time, the resulting gametes, one will be, have three alpha genes and one is going to have a single alpha gene. So this gamete, if uh, it's utilized in fertilization, is going to give rise to alpha thalassemia in the offspring. Whereas this one, uh, which is theoretically 50% in number, uh, is going to give rise to five alpha genes because this chromosome is going to contribute three and the other chromosome, uh, which they'll get from the other parent, is going to contribute two alpha chromosomes. So this is how it happens, giving rise to the alpha 3.7 deletion uh, and triplication. As on the other hand, if the Z2 and the Z1, respectively of the alpha 2 and alpha 1 line up, we have a neater split giving rise to the alpha 4.2 and triplicated as well as the deleted gametes, which can subsequently give rise to thalassemia or triplications. Over time, if a triplicated allele undergoes the same process another round, uh, they can end up uh, getting quadruplicated, pentuplicate, and so on. Right, so these are the alleles relevant for today's talk. And free alpha globin chains uh, are the backbone of uh, the pathogenesis uh, of beta thalassemia because they tend to precipitate, they tend to give rise to uh, uh, complement mediated hemolysis because of expression of abnormal neo antigens on the red cell surface. They will lead to lipid peroxidation and peroxidation of proteins, giving rise to hemolysis, as well as they'll lead to uh, premature degradation of GATA1, leading to a maturation arrest, and which, along with other factors, is going to push the cell into apoptosis. So we've been looking at these uh, patients uh, uh, with uh, alpha globin gene uh, uh, triplications and quadruplications. And in a recently concluded DM thesis by my student, Dr. Durga, we had 47 cases of beta thalassemia trait who were uh, uh, being investigated either because of uh, uh, the clinical symptoms being commenced uh, disproportionately uh, excessive or because their uh, uh, re uh, relatives had beta thalassemia major. So uh, we found 47 cases of BTT, which uh, who had super uh, numerary alpha globin genes of these about uh, of these 70% had been referred for hemolytic anemia testing because although they had beta thalassemia trait uh, that didn't explain uh, the presence of hemolysis or anemia in them a good number around 30% were tested as a part of family screening which tells us that these patients these persons may sometimes never present at all unless you test them this is a rare combination much less than um, uh, uh, somewhere around 0.1% uh, of all the hplcs that we do and they tend to present over a very wide range of ages, but half of them were older than 28 years. The ones who were symptomatic, 75% uh, of them had jaundice and 75% of them had anemia. So there was a good uh, chunk who, which had both the symptoms. So they are the commonest uh, uh, symptoms. Transfusion requirement was not uh, very common as is there in NTDT. 40% of these patients with beta thalassemia trait and uh, uh, supernumerary alpha globin genes ha had ever required a transfusion. The uh, severity of the phenotype in 64%, about uh, two thirds of the cases was like NTDT or beta thalassemia intermedia, but there was a good number, one third of them who were asymptomatic or very, very minimally symptomatic and had a beta thalassemia trait like of, uh, Phenotype. So obviously, this is a true polygenic disorder. There was one patient who was transfusion dependent out of these 47. Uh, within the uh, CBC, uh, hemoglobins tend to be not too bad with a mean of nine, but with a wide range, ranging from very severe to uh, probably in the transfusion dependent patient to the to a perfectly normal. And MCV and MCH were almost always helpful. They were in the microcytic hypochromic range. On HPLC, they had a variable picture. The largest number tended to show an elevated in elevation in HBF along with an A2, which was in the beta thal trait range. So that's one pointer to this particular combination. So uh, uh, about one fifth of them were a typical beta thalassemia trait with nothing on HPLC, with nothing to suggest that something more sinister was going on. And uh, a few had uh, borderline high A2 as well with uh, elevated HBF. So uh, in the blood picture, they tended to be 
microcytic hypochromic picture with target cells as is expected in thal traits but in addition there was an isopoikilocytosis a variable number of uh, nucleated red cells and some uh, this particular patient had undergone a splenectomy her phenotype was severe uh, so uh, these are hobble jolly bodies and these are pappenheimer bodies indicating the iron overload that happens in thalassemia intermedia patients and this is basophilic stippling so when we looked at the beta thalassemia mutations we found that uh, the ivs15 was the commonest but it was uh, present in 46% of the alleles and this data is going to be interesting when we compare it with the overall ti data which i'm going to be showing you very quickly very soon the common uh, the common indian uh, mutations uh, tended to form a majority of the subset and we had only one patient with a beta plus plus mutation which is minus 88 so the five common mutations were uh, nearly uh, three fourths the uh, three borderline cases all had the ivs15 don't ask me why uh, and the uh, yeah so this is where it gets interesting if you look at patients who have beta thalassemia trait and triplicated alpha genes you're going to find amongst the beta mutations the severe mutations so what does it tell us that for excess alpha genes to be exerting their influence into making a patient symptomatic the original beta insult needs to be severe so it has to be a bad underproduction of beta globin gene the chains along with excess of alpha chains for these patients because the majority of them tended to be severe uh, beta mutations and only one was a mild mutation ivs11 uh, tended to be in the asymptomatic commoner in the asymptomatic group and remember i told you that this tends to be co-inherited with the xln1 g gamma polymorphism uh this is the uh, pcr uh, that we do to test for this so the uh, so the, from this particular study the uh, uh, we suggest that uh, patients with beta thalassemia trait who have either disproportionate clinical symptoms who have a mild to moderate increase in hemoglobin f that is not related to pregnancy or whose blood films are looking more like thal intermedia should get tested for supernumerary alpha globin genes and that brings me to the last part of this talk which is what is the basic laboratory testing that's required to diagnose beta thalassemia intermedia and again i'd like to show it through the means of a data that we've been compiling and by which i hope to convince you that even a limited and economical genotypic panel tested on a very large number of patients can resolve the molecular genetic basis so for this uh, we looked at patients of beta thalassemia intermedia uh, taken over a long period of time and uh, we uh, had their clinical data and we looked at their uh, molecular investigations in the form of and this is our basic panel the hbb variant which they had which could be done by arms pcr or by uh, sander sequencing uh, and alpha globin gene deletions as well as triplications so if you have thal intermedia one is going to need to test for both of these deletions and triplications as well as the xmn1 g gamma polymorphism which explains about one third of the f variation so out of these uh, thalassemia intermedia patients uh, there, there were a small proportion of the hplcs during this time thalassemia intermedia typically is only about uh, one fifth to one sixth of the thal major patients that present in the same period of time so it's a less common diagnosis than tdt uh, uh, 60% for males the age range is wide and so there there's some patients now this is interesting who will get diagnosed early on at 6 months of age so one would uh, say that why are you calling them uh, ntdt or ti so these were patients who subsequently were shown to have a milder course they sometimes they'll get diagnosed because they have a sibling who's already diagnosed and uh, the parents are more vigilant and they require testing sometimes uh, they get diagnosed because of disproportionate jaundice uh, or blood film findings so occasionally ntdts will come earlier and even for clinicians there's a, a message here that uh, gauging the transfusion requirement even of a child with homozygous or compound heterozygous beta globin alleles is um, a clinical nuance and skill which um, i'm sure uh, everyone practices and sometimes they can present really late as well typically these sort of presentations are with extramedullary uh, masses with often para vertebrae so the mean hemoglobin can range uh, sometimes these patients can have crashes in their hemoglobin uh, in the uh, in when they have intercurrent infections or during pregnancy 
to an almost normal hemoglobin. Uh, usually, the hemoglobin is above six to seven grams per deciliter, which is also uh, what we found. Uh, nothing surprising in MCH and MCH. RDW is typically elevated. Hemoglobin F in thalassemia intermedia is typically between 15 to 60 percent. Occasionally, it can be lower as well. Sometimes the lab will only get to test them after they've been transfixed, which is why they have such lower limits as well. But also remember the uh, NTDT patients with alpha triplications who did not uh, 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 have an elevated HBF. A2 typically in thal intermedia tends to be elevated uniformly uh, as opposed to thal major or TDT where A2 can be high, low or normal and does not help in uh, the uh, diagnosis. So this is the spectrum of uh, HPLC findings uh, that one gets in thalassemia intermedia. Uh, F may be extremely low. This is a patient who was compound heterozygous for a severe large deletion and a mild beta plus mutation, which is CAP plus one. The A2 in this patient was 5.4%, although uh, the F was not elevated. So uh, for the pathologists uh, who watched, uh, listening to this webinar, I'm sure at this point you could be asking, why are you even testing this patient further? Why couldn't this just be, suppose the genetics was not available, why couldn't it just be a beta thalassemia trait based on the HPLC uh, with a slightly elevated F of 3%? Well, yes, but this patient, he was actually referred uh, by uh, Professor Subhash Varga uh, 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 from Fortis, was referred because he had a big spleen and uh, he had uh, anemia, which was recurrent. Every two, three years, he'd require a transfusion. So, the clinical diagnosis there was uh, hereditary spherocytosis, but uh, since the retic was not high, uh, subsequently this genetic testing for thal intermedia was done, and he was actually having two beta mutations. So he was an NTD. This is the more uh, classic finding where HBF is 60%, and this patient has a frame shift 89 and a, again the CAP plus 1 mutation. This is a re slightly rarer situation. This is a patient who is homozygous for IBS 1.5. HBF is 95.6%, but the presentation is less severe, probably because this patient has inherited the XMN1 G gamma polymorphism in a homozygous state, as well as is alpha delete. So when we look at the HBB variants in thalassemia intermedia, the overall uh, the hemoglobin variants which are found will include, a, even here, a larger number of beta naught variants as compared to beta plus variants. But the key difference, uh, so. These are 1,5 and 1,1 one, one are beta naught and severe beta plus, whereas I, CAP plus 1 and minus 88 are milder mutations. But the common five mutations, which are all severe, will comprise 50, about half the alleles, which is much lower than uh, what will happen if you are analyzing a similar data set of transfusion-dependent thalassemia. So the proportion of severe mutations is going to come down. When we look at alpha globin genotypes, a substantial number of them are going to show us alpha deletions, uh, uh, as well as uh, when this specific cohort is from the previous study that I showed, these are patients in whom triplication testing uh, is done and they are heterozygous for beta globin mutations. So when we look at the uh, alpha deletions, which is alpha thalassemia, we can see a nice pattern which is emerging. So patients who have severe beta mutations which means that they should have presented with transfusion dependent thalassemia actually have a high frequency of alpha deletions. So they need alpha deletions to come into this group of thal intermedia or NTDT. As the uh, percent, uh, uh, severity of beta mutations keeps coming down, the percentage of alpha deletions that one is going to find is going to come down. So what does this tell for the laboratories? The first test for the beta globin uh, mutations if a patient with NTDT has two severe beta globin mutations, then you definitely need to test for alpha globin deletions. On the other hand, if you find only one beta, beta globin mutation, you need to test for alpha triplications. On the other hand, the alpha XMN1 operates in the opposite way. So uh, this was found in a, unsurprisingly, a very large number of cases. And uh, these uh, persons had higher uh, amounts of HBF as compared to those with them unfavorable phenotype. Um, as expected, this correlated very well with the IVS11 uh, inheritance. And here's where it's interesting. So when we looked at patients who have beta naught, beta naught genotypes, these patients tend to have a very high frequency of the XMN1 favorable allele. 
because again they have a bad beta genotype they could need a good xmn1 genotype to get rescued and come to the ti group on the other hand the patients who have a beta plus mutation will have a lower frequency expected frequency and manifest frequency of xmn1 because they don't need it they already have a milder mutation okay so uh, uh the conclusion from this was that out of our 256 ti cases uh, uh, about two thirds had a beta not uh, uh, had at least one beta plus globin mutation uh, those with uh, beta not beta not genotypes had either coexisting alpha thalassemia in nearly half the cases they had at least one t allele of the xmn1 in also half the cases and their overlap and then we had this group which was uh, uh, i discussed earlier of beta thalassemia traits who presented with ti who had alpha triplications so at the end of this very modest and doable panel of testing only 3 to 4% of the cases are going to get unexplained and this is why uh, we feel that this can explain the majority of beta ti cases so uh, i think this is also a good point uh, to end this talk uh, ntdt remember includes not just beta ti but also hbh disease and hbe beta thalassemia unfortunately uh, uh, because these are extremely interesting and complex disorders we haven't had time to take that up in today's webinar um, and uh, uh, we also don't see uh, too much of e beta sitting in chandigarh but uh, uh, i'd be uh, very happy to listen to the experiences of i can see some of the uh, discussions from uh, the north uh, from the eastern parts of the country hbh is much less common it's a fascinating wilderness which uh, i think i would had i included it i wouldn't have been able to do justice to the beta ti parts of the ntd and with that i'll say thank you and hand you over back to professor thank you thank you professor prashant for that lovely presentation lot of learning i learned a lot from this i'm sure everybody must have so we'll go to the q and a session and i can see the raise hand sign which we are going to use Asmuk Balar is the first one. Uh, thank you, Dr. Prashant. It was very useful uh, presentation. I can say thank my you. thought was not clear uh, previously before this lecture uh, regarding pathophysiology of uh, NTDD. Uh, my question is that if a patient, uh, uh, asymptomatic patient, alpha supernumerary, do we get any clue on uh, RBC indices, peripheral smear on HPLC? If asymptomatic Uh, carrier alpha supernumerary and beta is normal uh, there's no thalassemia beta thalassemia trait right? beta thalassemia yes yes oh so so you're actually looking at a person who is alpha yeah. supernumerary i myself have five alpha globin genes my hemograms are perfectly normal always and oh. uh, yeah so if you don't do the genetic so alpha triplications um, uh, as long as there's the beta component is intact are asymptomatic uh, clinically as well as uh, silent on uh, hplc and cbc okay thank you yeah, can i ask another, yeah. yeah can i ask uh, another question yeah of course uh, sir, just as i uh, we know that if a patient has a beta thal trait coincident with the alpha uh, supernumerary then it is bvc like a entity but if same beta thal trait coincident coincident with the uh triple deplet uh, deletion of alpha then what will be the phenotype well, that's again a very good question uh the uh, clinical phenotype is going to be perfectly normal okay, okay. so uh yeah there uh, but in the lab things are going to go completely wonky and why is that it's because when you do an hplc of this patient who's got beta thalassemia trait heterozygous but has also got alpha thalassemia which is co-inherited their a2 is going to start coming down so if it's an antenatal woman and we're doing an hplc to screen for beta thal trait in her because of her co-inherited alpha thalassemia her a2 will come down to either borderline and can sometimes even become normal so she can get missed and she'll end up having a thal major child if her husband is also beta trait uh, you know and the baby supposes unlucky enough to not get the alpha deletions from the mom uh, number one secondly when alpha and beta thalassemia get co-inherited the red cell indices also tend to normalize so that makes it an even bigger pitfall for labs to miss it um, so thank you for bringing it up thank you sir thank you thank you thank you asma dr urbi bala 
uh, thank you, sir, for the excellent presentation. So, uh, two, three, <laughs> two, three uh, means practical uh, experiences from our OPD, like especially in pregnant patients with uh, beta thalassemia trait. Means hemoglobin HPLC suggested for beta thal trait, but uh, we find that uh, we get uh, so many patients, but their uh, anemia is uh, quite disproportional. Means sometimes some patients will go on to develop transfusion dependence, while some will maintain hemoglobin around 9, 10, uh, even with a beta thal trait. In those cases, should we go for this uh, genotyping? Means to look for means this alpha uh, triplications or not. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, and maybe for the rest of the audience, I can give some background. Dr. Bhattacharji uh, finished her DM with us recently and she's uh, herself a big expert on thals. She's asking this question to illust maybe to test me, I don't know, but uh, I'm kidding. So uh, uh, yeah, so this is not an... Uh, it's not a, in a specialist hematology practice, it is not an uncommon situation where all you get is a beta thal trait. But you also know that three to 5% of the population is beta thal trait. So are we, are we missing a more serious disorder? Could it be an MDS that we're missing by attributing an, all the anemia to, uh, and the indices now are not going to help because they'll be like thal trait. So the answer to your question is a resounding yes. Uh, alpha triplication testing should definitely be used much more than it is currently. Uh, if somebody can afford an MLPA, that's superior to the PCR. But even if nothing else is done, the 3.7 and 4.2 uh, triplications or quadruplication, the uh, PCR that we do are uh, is good enough to reveal the identity, uh, the underlying cause. There will be a subset of patients where it will come back normal. And in such patients, uh, the clinicians often will have to probably extend the scope of their testing to include non-thalassemic disorders as well. I, I guess, but you know that better than me. Thank you. And sir, another question. Uh, as you, as from the study uh, of uh, Dr. Durga, you revealed that many patients of uh, beta thalassemia, I think a uh, trait or intermediate was referred for jaundice. Yeah. Uh, sir, yes, uh, sir, was the Gilbert's association means it's out of the topic, I know, but we find a lot of uh, UGTO and A1 polymorphisms uh, in these patients, particularly with beta thalassemia trait with uh, jaundice, who particularly present because of jaundice. So it, it's not out of uh, scope at all because uh, we talk about NTDT and some NTDTs will be completely transfusion free. They'll only be coming because they went to hepatology and they had unconjugated jaundice and then hemolytic workup got started, but the retic is not raised and so on. And then we'll find that they actually have a very mild thalassemic disorder. So we occasionally have patients who are also compound heterozygous. They have two uh, beta mutations and the presenting symptom is, feature is jaundice and gallstones and splenomegaly and not so much anemia. So actually when we talk of NTDT, uh, I kept my talk mainly lab, uh, but the uh, clinical features which are commoner in NTDT as compared to TDT are extramedullary hematopoiesis, iron overload disproportionate to the amount of transfusions they've received and gallstones and jaundice. So uh, that's often a good clue to, uh, to still pursue the beta uh, or the globin uh, disorder testing line in a patient, yeah, especially if the retic is not high and you know that this is not HS or an enzymopathy, a hereditary spherocytosis or an enzyme. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Sunil. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you, Dr. Prashant. Uh, be well done. I want to listen to you forever, actually. Um, I have been... Uh, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, one comment, actually, that is, I think you nicely illustrated the flow. Am I able, sir? Uh, you're getting broken. You uh, can uh, put off your uh, video. Let's see. Hello. You put off your video, then maybe you will be more distinct. Hello. Can you hear me, sir? Hello. Very, very intermittently. Put off your video. You may be more distinct. Hello. No, we have a problem. We can't get you. I, I put off my video, sir. I think you can. Yeah, try now. Please carry on. 
Hello. Yeah, put your question, Sunil. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Prashad, I basically, you know, uh, that was nicely illustrated the, uh, you know, the heterogeneity in the group and, uh, you know, and, and you showed the Mahindra University, um, you know, that group, you know, the classification as, and if you see that still, you know, depends on blood transfusions actually. Uh, so, so I, the comment I wanted to actually make is that OT is, um, is a non transfusion so, you know, you know, in, in the higher end of the spectrum, you'll have patients who, who may not really maintain hemoglobin 7, 7.5, a lot of extramural hematopoiesis, and those are the ones actually uh, will be a challenge. And I you know what I'm trying to basically, uh, you know, put a point is that I think we need to be liberal in transfusing those uh, rather than having, uh, you know, the complications of... Uh, uh, but yeah, I chronic anemia. Yeah. So I, I still, you know, I'm not very sure whether definition and is still correct because you know, all, all students as well as the doctors sometimes, and you know, these these kids and patients do get mismanaged. In the, in. So my question is, uh, Dr. Prashant, is so after comment is on, uh, uh, you know, you just we secondary modifiers. Annual emissions as the antenatal or for diagnostic purpose, we never go to the second step of, of uh, checking for the modifiers. Uh, guidance, what are the, uh, should we check for everyone or what are the group of the patients? You suggest that we should look for secondary modifiers. That's number one. And number two, how do you think that will have uh, clinical implications, both for uh, major as well as intermediate? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sunil. I think I got that. So, uh, the uh, if I may just uh, add, first of all, thank you for making that first comment. Um, because yes, you're right. Uh, patients A uh, are across a very wide spectrum, and two, they change over time as well. So, actually, uh, some recent uh, articles have started using slightly more uh, have added terms. So, there's something called a Neo transfusion dependent thalassemia. So that's still NTDT, but the N stands for NEO. I, I'm sure you're aware. Uh, so, uh, so these are patients who were previously not transfusion dependent, but as they got older, maybe some contribution by alloimmunization, some contribution by increased demand, they have now become transfusion dependent. In addition, as therapies advance, and uh, Urmimala has worked with uh, uh, thalidomide uh, uh, and other HBF inducers. So there may be some patients who respond dramatically to therapy who were previously transfusion dependent. So now there's another uh, terminology that's used called X transfusion dependent. So ETDT, XTDT patients. And within that spectrum, your point is absolutely cogent that the very severe ones, uh, it's probably going to be a matter of semantics or a clinical acumen rather, I think that's correct, to be able to judge uh, uh, exactly where the patient lies and sometimes it may not even be necessary for the severe TDT, uh, severe NTDT versus the TDT. Uh, coming to the uh, question, what would be the uh, optimal uh, investigative strategy? So see, if, as, if you have a patient who is non-transfusion dependent, uh, then I would suggest don't stop at HPLC go ahead with molecular testing in all cases. At the very least, the beta globin genotype should be asserted. If you have a homozygous beta plus, beta plus, you know, or a compound heterozygous of two mild mutations and cost is a concern, you can stop there because you know, uh, number one, why this patient is behaving in such a way. You can counsel the family uh, and so on. Uh, especially if it's cap plus one, you can tell them that, you know, the people who inherit it may be getting missed by HPLC. Um, because that's again got a borderline area. If you have a patient who's, uh, and that happens fairly frequently, who's got one beta plus and a one beta naught mutation, then I would suggest we need to go in for alpha deletion as well as triplications. We typically do both the PCRs as well as XMN1 testing, which is just a PCR RFLP. It should not be more than three, 4,000 rupees. Uh, so it's like a sort of a genetic passport. That we do this for, of course, all the patients here, but then a lot of research goes on here. But I think even for clinical management, it's a good idea to have somewhere on file that this is the beta, alpha, and XMN1 genotype of this patient. Um, 
this is for ti if you have a patient of tdt um you could uh, argue that this is tdt which is tdt which is tdt uh, i would uh, why do i even need the beta genotype and certainly some of the old time clinicians would say how is it going to change your management uh, the patient is transfusion dependent uh, well the answer is yes um, at the very least get a parental hplc of every tdt patient to ensure that they are beta thalassemia trait and not beta plus delta beta or some other uh, funky combination because on the child's hpl proband's hplc we won't be able to tell uh, but having said that uh, there also it's not a bad idea i would say to know uh, uh, if the patient has the uh, alpha thalassemia trait you could try extending the ex ex interval between transfusions or if you know their xmn1 plus plus we have cases like that because you know often the treating hematologist initiates the transfusion regimen but the patient subsequently goes to the blood bank gets transfusion goes uh, you know they don't often get reviewed except maybe annually or six monthly for their hormones and stuff so uh, uh, so i would suggest the whole, whole hog if they can afford it uh, but definitely in ntdt thank you uh, how do you thank, do with that thank you very much. if you have comments on that okay thank you sunil dr satish yeah thank you sir thank you dr prashant for enlightening us wonderful talk as uh, dr sunil said i think i can listen to this talk again though some of the doubts have cleared i think i would have to go and study again the pathophysiology uh, you partly answered my question about uh, because in the study you have done various pcr sanger sequencing so i wanted to know how to if you have a patient how do we go about investigation you rightly said first do a first find out what is a mutation and see uh, then proceed so for uh, alpha, for beta thalassemia trait patients who are transfusion dependent uh, to check for uh, alpha triplication so you you would suggest a pcr only pcr based uh, testing only right uh, no if money is not a concern i would suggest an mlpa because that's going to screen for a wider range see the alpha 3.7 and alpha 4.2 are anyway going to cover 80 to 90% probably higher number of indian supernumerary genes so so that's a judgment the pcr is much cheaper in a center which is running it will be like 500 rupees mlp most labs will be 5000 at least so that's a okay so mlp would be a better thing if they can afford it it's more comprehensive yeah okay thank you thank you prashant second question is have you seen any hbd component reservoirs hbd beta thal presenting as thalassemia intermedia uh, so there's a lot of parents come one parent yeah. has hbd Uh, heterozygous and other uh, parent is thalassemia trait it's so difficult to tell them should they go for prenatal uh, diagnosis or shall we just leave it because most of the time even if it's compound heterozygous they are asymptomatic medical legally what should we do uh, thank you for raising that we face this problem as well i mean our gynecologists and genetics people face it as well and they uh, uh, if they want to play it safe they send it to us to give it in writing that this combination does not uh, mandate a uh, prenatal diagnosis or a medical termination uh, and they always document it very properly that the couple has been counseled that the chance of a hal intermedia which is anything more than mild or moderate is extremely rare but rare of course doesn't mean impossible uh, there are guidelines out there uh, i should have probably put it in somewhere where d beta Uh, is not an indication the possibility of a d beta in the fetus is not an indication for prenatal testing so you could cite that medical legally yes be safe write it down because you know one in 200 babies will turn out to have splenomegaly now or have a hemoglobin of 7 would that have been indication enough to uh, kill them off in utero we can discuss that but uh, the parents are not going to be happy if you told them it's not required and they already knew and Uh, even with d beta they can be supernumerary alpha globin genes and so many things that we don't test for so as long as you can tell the parents and they can grasp that there are a lot of unknowns and even if we take out the fetus's dna we are not going to be able to test for everything there are yes. interesting papers on that so um, so it's probably best to leave some things unexplored okay. thank you right thank you thank you dr prashant Thank can you. i quickly add one thing sir here uh, we have seen lot of hbs with d uh, and they all are like transfusion dependent most of the patients which we have hbs with d 
Yeah, so that thank you for uh, raising that. I'm sorry, who is this? Uh, oh. So I'm Dr. Sangeeta Mudliya. Uh, Hi, uh, Dr. Sangeeta. Thank hey. you. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, you want to go on? Because I just want to add a little bit. Yeah, no, please, please add up. Yeah, just so yes, the obvious exception, and I suspect Dr. Satish probably knows that if you have a D Punjab person and they're married to an S trait, Hmm. Then obviously uh, go ahead. And yes, yes, yes. Absolutely, absolutely. And to that, I'd like to add: if you have a D Iran married trait, married to an S trait, then the combo is not going to be symptomatic. You can reassure them. The poor prognosis is only with D Punjab. Punjab. Okay. Thank okay. you, but Madam, for uh, yeah. Thank. The you. discussion Thank is you so only much. for D Beta. That's yes. What yes. we face. S is uncommon in my practice. Thank you, Doctor Jagdish. Good evening, uh, Dr. Prashant. That was really a very wonderful talk. Uh, you have discussed a lot of uh, uh, things about the genotypes and a uh, lot of questions had been on uh, the genotype only. So my questions are more clinical. Um, have you looked at the the hydria response versus presence of x one polymorphism in Indian patients? Because uh, the data is quite conflicting in uh, whatever we see in TGT at least. That is one, and second is uh, uh, NTDT with thrombosis. Uh, what is the what is your data on factor five laden mutation in those? Uh, so the second part is easier to answer. We haven't uh, looked at uh, thrombosing patients. Is uh, you know, I mean, at least I'm unaware if it was done okay. before I joined. So um, uh, the first XMN1, part, yeah, yeah. So uh, actually, yes, uh, it's been going on. We've had a study. We have studies going on, those patients are on long-term follow-up, where uh, uh, patients with different forms of uh, symptomatic thalassemia syndromes receive thalidomide, hydria, and, uh, um, uh, and neither. Uh, and th there's a heterogeneity of response. Uh, I'm not sure. That paper is about to get published in the IGHB. The uh, one-and-a-half-year follow-up of this, Dr. Urmimala is the lead author in that. She was the trial leader under Dr. Uh, Alka Khadwal. Uh, I was a co-investigator in that thesis. Um, so very short term, as I recall, uh, I think I can discuss this because it's out for publication. Uh, uh, the responses were not very, very dramatic. And the XMN1 didn't help uh, predict the occasional patient who had a response to either thalidomide or hydroxy, number one. Having said that, now it's been almost two and a half years and the data has been matured and there are patients who've responded remarkably well. And while some of them are XMN1++, about an equal number are not. So that's where the role of a wider genotyping uh, is coming in. That's a research area. Uh, we're planning to take up the DNA of these patients for a bigger uh, panel of F influencers because clearly, Somebody should be already on the threshold of increasing HBF for the push by these drugs to be uh, working well. And in others, it doesn't. Uh, but that's all I know at my laboratory. So as of now, uh, do you think that uh, before prescribing uh, hydroxyurea, one should look at the XMN polyphism to know whether it would, if the patient is the, going to respond or not? For sickle, there is certainly data. And if, if the test is available, I would suggest... Uh, Yes, sir. And okay. for thal intermedia also, hydroxyurea is fairly uh, often prescribed. So uh, again, um, I don't know for what it's worth, but it, it certainly is not going to be useless. It will uh, give a few pointers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Priyanka. Good evening, sir. Thank Good you. Good evening, madam. Here. And uh, thank you, Dr. Prashant. It was excellent listening to you. Now, I come from the belt of sickle cells, so I will have some questions regarding that. We have a patient, actually the mother is delta beta thalassemia and she is heterozygous for that. Father is sickle heterozygous straight. They have one child who is affected and uh, she has both delta beta as well as uh, it is uh, uh, for uh, the HPS and they are now asking for the second uh, baby and the first child actually she has very few uh, episodes of uh, crisis or uh, pain. So how do we counsel regarding having this next child or the baby, whether uh, the patient should be, uh, the mother should be allowed to take up the pregnancy 
or uh, they should be asked to be terminated. Thank you, uh, Madam. That's a really challenging situation because Delta Beta uh, is uh, always, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> plays uh, the joker in uh, these situations. Because, so first of all, let me start out by saying that for thalassemia, for non-transfusion dependent thalassemia, we typically don't offer at the laboratory end or avoid offering prenatal testing because. Uh, while we can, in your uh, patient, the two events are clear cut. So one can test and say whether the fetus is going to be double heterozygous or not. The phenotype itself is going to be dependent on so many other things. So uh, usually uh, the clinicians are successful in counseling the uh, family that termination is for patients who are going to be really transfusion dependent. So. Uh, no, yeah. just a minute, uh, Dr. Prashant, in sickle patients, they may not be always transfusion dependent, but when the crisis comes up, that is again a difficult part for the patients to handle. And it is difficult also for these patients to understand how they are going to behave because she's at the first child is a girl child. And um, once attends the puberty, possibly that time the crisis will be more mm -hmm. and she is in the school. Previously, she was not symptomatic till the age of seven years. I see. Have you come across like Delta, Beta, and D or uh, other uh, hemoglobinopathies? We see uh, Delta, Beta with thal uh, often, and uh, usually it's like a severe thal intermedia. So in such situations, we would offer uh, prenatal if the family wants it, is okay with it. Um, for stickle with Delta, Beta, if the phenotype is worsening, um, with age, um, it's a tough call. I don't know. I mean, you, obviously, it's a... You have to counsel the patient rather. Yeah. Okay. Or if they're very desperate, sometimes they've done it. It's also... It's not like a... We'll never do it for prenatal for TM. But then, with, again, with a lot of things that, you know, we're not testing for alpha. We're not looking at XM in, in the fetal DNA. We're just going to tell you whether... Sometimes, if it's heterozygous, then they go home happy. Uh, yeah. You know, so... Uh, Okay, sir, can I ask another question? Yes. Sure. Yeah, so when do you ask for uh, testing for a dominant thalassemia? And second, what would be the test you would prefer or you would advise to the patient to pick this mutation up? Thank you uh, for saying that, bringing that up. Yeah, so dominant thalassemias uh, typically are uh, extremely unstable, so the reticulocyte count would go up. And although their HPLC would look like a thal trait with mild or moderately elevated F, uh, which means the HPLC didn't explain why they are behaving like NTGT. But because of the reticulocytosis, one would go ahead with, you. I'd say probably beta globin sequencing. The way we do it is exon 1 and 2 in the first go and exon 3 in the second um, would probably be the best test to do. Because, you know, and it had come up earlier and I was thinking if I should put, how are we doing for time? So we need to wind up. It's okay. Go ahead. So even for beta testing, I just said uh, in answer to uh, Dr. Bhatt's question that look, determine the beta genotype. But for thal intermedia, if you do arms PCR uh, one by one per mutation, it's going to be quite cumbersome. So uh, what uh, our technician would do is if it's a JAT6, she'd go for minus 88. If it, the parents have borderline A2, she'd do a cap plus one first. Or if it's completely uh, uh, could be anything, then just the common five. We've multiplexed a few of them. And then go ahead with sequencing because uh, that will give it. Remember, sequencing, of course, will not pick up larger deletions. So that's something one needs to bear in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, a question from the audience Do you see gynecomastia in NTDT? I, I think I should ask the experts on the panel. I, I probably, uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't see patients. Right. So it's not a common finding. Uh, there may, might have been anecdote, but that's not the standard finding. The next question from the audience is, is the data of hetero beta with alpha multiplication, you showed fetal hemoglobin in the range of 0.5 to 18. What made you suspect alpha multiplication with a fetal hemoglobin of 0.5? Uh, thank you, sir. So, Dr. Ekta, uh, in those cases, we suspected because the clinical phenotype was discordantly severe and uh, the clinicians kept discussing the patients in the rounds or sending it back. You know, we need to know why 
they are behaving more severely. Secondly, the blood film typically will not have the uniform microcytic hypochromic picture of beta thaltrate. It will have an isopoikilo cytosis, sometimes one or two NRBCs. So uh, even the pathologist's antenna will go up. That this is not looking like a classic BTT. Thank you. And she has one more question. In heterozygous beta thalassemia, A2 is elevated. In homozygous beta thalassemia, fetal hemoglobin is elevated. Why does alpha chain preferably bind yeah. to delta in hetero Sorry. and uh, gamma in homo? Oh, so let me put it this way. Uh, in, uh, first, let me answer this uh, more commonly asked but equally difficult question. Why does hemoglobin A2 go up in beta thalassemia trait? Yeah, this is a very common question that we keep asking. The answer to that is two, uh, mainly. Number one, uh, because beta globin production is down, so the alpha 2, beta 2, or the adult A0 hemoglobin percentage will be affected a little bit. The person is heterozygous. So a relative increase in A2 is going to happen. So from 2.0 to 3.3%, it'll go somewhere between 4 to 8%. Okay, so because ultimately it's a percentage. So if A0 is coming down, the other two will go up. The other thing is what the point that you raised, uh, uh, that uh, the uh, step up, uh, is because of the looping of the chromatin, uh, because of the transcription factors. So that happens best if the beta globin chain is deleted. And in beta uh, thalassemia, deletions are less common. Right? So, um, so because most of them are point mutations, that's a less common reason. Uh, that, so, so the F doesn't go up that much. We see beta thal patients with high F occasionally, a lot of them are pregnant. So in the second trimester of pregnancy, fetal hemoglobin can go up to 5% normally. Uh, some of them, if you investigate, will have uh, some transacting factor issues or uh, will be XMN1 plus plus. So F regulation is heterogeneous. Okay. Uh, the other part of your question is, why does F go up in delta beta thalassemia? I, um, so in delta beta thalassemia, now there's no delta globin. So A2 is going to come down even if they're heterozygous, one delta globin gene is gone. Um, and consequently, the uh, activity on the gamma is higher because, yeah, the beta and delta are gone. Uh, I hope that answers the interesting question. Thank you. There are no more questions from the audience. Are there any more questions from the faculty here? So can I ask one question? Yes, Amit, go ahead. Uh, just regarding one more discussion I had asked previously also regarding the occurrence of Gilbert syndrome uh, uh, in a patient with thalassemia intermedia. I had a similar case. A patient was hemoglobin E disease from Kolkata and the patient had also mutations positive for Gilbert syndrome. How is it happening? How, how common is that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you for bringing it up again because I think I, uh, I didn't fully answer. Uh, I think it was Dr. Ulmi Mala uh, who asked this. Uh, so the Gilbert syndrome, number one, is extremely common in northern in India, most places, and but especially in the northern, at least in the northern Indian part where I practice, between ten to twenty percent of persons. I'm talking about general population are going to be homozygous for the TA seven by seven repeats. Okay, and. Uh, so, and they will obviously have slightly higher bilirubins. Many of them will not be high enough to come to clinical attention. But so when our hepatologists send us asymptomatic, uh, unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia for Gilbert testing, their strike rate is near 100%. Because it is so common. And then if you test the people who've come with some jaundice and you've ruled out other liver or hemolytic pathologies, uh, then bingo, it's good. In fact, I'm sure uh, Professor Agarwal could bear me out. Uh, not so long ago, Gilbert was diagnosed clinically that, uh, you know, your LFTs are fine. You've got some jaundice, you're clinically okay. You have Gilbert, go back and enjoy your life. And uh, if I may add, uh, the Gilbert syndrome and the unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia actually acts as an antioxidant. So now there's sufficient literature that people who have TA7 by 7 homozygous state actually have lower frequencies of diabetes mellitus, hyperlipid, basically the metabolic syndrome. So NAFLD, uh, they're lower because for some reason, uh, the mop-up of free radicals is superior in them. So that's something to tell people uh, who turn out to be uh, Gilbert. So yes, the uh, Gilbert testing should be encouraged in persons with biochemical unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. It's a simple sequencing, should be inexpensive, but relatively. 
and uh, very uh, gratifying clinically. Thank you for asking that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any more questions, please? Okay, if none, then uh, Dr. Prashant, extremely grateful to you for conducting this webinar. My pleasure, sir. It was so useful that it cannot be described in words. I'm sure everybody learned a lot. Thanks to the faculty, mm -hmm. thanks to our sponsors, NATCO, and the event uh, organizer team from Perfect. Thank you. And just to remind you again, audience, tomorrow we do not have a webinar. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Good it night. was a pleasure for me. Thank you. Thank you.